Section 15 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 15, Chapter 5. Arianism by M. H. Quatkin. Further, the recognition of eternal distinctions in the divine nature establishes within that nature a social element before which despotism or slavery in earth or heaven stands condemned. It makes illogical the conception of God as inscrutable power in whose acts we must not presume to seek for reason, a conception common to Rome, Islam and Geneva. Yet more, if God himself is not a despot, but a constitutional sovereign who rules by law and desires his subjects to see reason in his acts, this is an ideal which must profoundly influence political thought. True, there was little sign for centuries of any such influence. The empire did not grow less despotic, and such ideas of freedom as the Teutons brought in did not come out of the gospel and if Islam and the papacy lean to despotism, the Unitarians have done honourable work in the cause of liberty. But thoughts which colour the whole of life may have to work for ages before they are clearly understood. The Latin Church of the Middle Ages was not a mere apotheosis of power like Islam, and when Teutonic Europe broke away from Latin tutelage, the way was prepared for the slow recognition of a higher ideal than power, and our own age is beginning to see better the profound and far-reaching significance of the Nicene decision, not for religion only, but for political, scientific, and social thought. The victory won at Nicaea was decisive. Arianism started vigorously, and seemed for a while the winning side. But the moment it faced the council, it collapsed before the all but anonymous reprobation of the Christian churches. Only two bishops from the edge of the African desert ventured to deny that it contradicts the essentials of the gospel. The decision was free, for Constantine would not risk another Donatist controversy by putting pressure on the bishops before he could safely crush the remnant. And it was permanent, for words deliberately put into a creed cannot be removed without admitting that the objection to them is valid on one ground or another. Thus, Arianism was not only condemned, but condemned in the most impressive way by the assembly which comes nearer than any other in history to the stately dream of a concrete Catholic Church speaking words of divine authority. No later gathering could pretend to rival the august assembly where Christendom had once for all pronounced the condemnation of Arianism, and no later movements were able definitely to reverse its decision. But if the conservatives, who were the mass of the eastern bishops, had signed the creed with a good conscience, they had no idea of making it their working belief. They were not Arians, or they would not have torn up the Arianizing creed at Nicaea, but if they had been hearty Nicenes, no influence of the court could have kept up an Arianizing reaction for half a century. Christendom as a whole was neither Arian nor Nicene, but conservative. If the East was not Nicene, neither was it Arian, but conservative. And if the West was not Arian, neither was it Nicene, but conservative also. But conservatism was not the same in East and West. Eastern conservatism inherited its doctrine from the age of subordination theories, and dreaded the Nicene definition as needless and dangerous. But the Westerns had no great interest in the question, and could scarcely even translate its technical terms into Latin, and in any case their minds were much more legal than the Greek, so they simply fell back on the authority of the Great Council. Shortly, East and West were alike conservative, but while conservatism in the East went behind the Council, in the West it was content to start from it. The Eastern reaction was therefore mainly conservative. The Arians were the tail of the party, 
they were not outcasts only because conservative hesitation at the Nicene Creed kept open the back door of the church for them. For thirty years they had to shelter themselves behind the conservatives. It was not until 357 that they ventured to have a policy of their own, and then they broke up the anti-Nicene coalition at once. The strength of Arianism was that while it claimed to be Christian, it brought together, and to the logical results, all the elements of heathenism in the current Christian thought. So the reaction rested not only on conservative timidity, but on the heathen influences around. And heathenism was still a living power in the world, strong in numbers, and still stronger in the imposing memories of history. Christianity was still an upstart on Caesar's throne, and no man could yet be sure that victory would not sway back to the side of the immortal gods. So the Nicene Age was preeminently an age of waverers, and every waverer leaned to Arianism as a via media between Christianity and heathenism. The court also leaned to Arianism. The genuine Arians, indeed, were not more pliant than the Nicenes, but conservatives are always open to the influence of a court, and the intriguers of the court, and under Constantius they were legion, found it in their interest to unsettle the Nicene decisions, in the name of conservatism, forsooth. To put it shortly, the Arians could have done nothing without a formidable mass of conservative discontent behind them, and the conservatives would have been equally helpless if the court had not supplied them with the means of action. The ultimate power lay with the majority, which was at present conservative, while the initiative rested with the court, which leaned on Asia, so that the reaction went on as long as both were agreed against the Nicene Doctrine. It was suspended when Julian's policy turned another way, became unreal when conservative alarm subsided, and came to an end when Asia went over to the Nicenes. The contest, 325 to 381, falls into two main periods, separated by the Council of Constantinople in 360, when the success of the reaction seemed complete. We have also halts of importance at the return of Athanasius in 346 and the death of Julian in 363. The first period is a fight in the dark, as Socrates calls it, but upon the whole the conservative coalition steadily gained ground till 357, in spite of Nicene reactions after Constantine's death in 337 and the detection of Stephen's plot in 344. First, the Arianizing leaders had to obtain their own restoration, then to depose the Nicene chiefs one after another. By 341, the way was open for a series of attempts to replace the Nicene creed by something that would let in the Arians. But this meant driving out the Nicenes, for they could not compromise without complete surrender, and the West was with the Nicenes in refusing to unsettle the creed. Western influence prevailed at Sardica in 343, and Western intervention secured an uneasy truce which lasted till Constantius became master of the West in 353. Meanwhile, conservatism was softening into a less hostile semi-Arian form, while Arianism was growing into a more offensive Anomonian doctrine. So the conservatives were less interested when Constantius renewed the contest and took alarm at the open Arianism of the Simeon Manifesto in 357. This brought things to a deadlock and gave rise to a homoian or professedly neutral party supported by the Anomaeans and the court. They were repulsed at Seleucia by a new alliance of semi-Arians and Nicenes and at Ariminum by the conservative West but their command of the court enabled them to exile the semi-Aryan leaders after the Council of Constantinople in 360. The second period of the reaction opens with a precarious Homoian supremacy. It was grievously shaken at the outset by Julian's restoration of the exiles. The Nicenes were making rapid progress and might have restored peace if Julian had lived longer. But Valens, with a feebler character and a weaker position, returned to the policy of Constantius. For the moment, it may have been the best policy, but
but the permanent forces were for the Nicenes, and their issue was only a question of time. There were misunderstandings in abundance, but a fairly united party hailed in Theodosius, 379, an orthodox emperor from the west. The Arians were first put out of the churches, then formally condemned by the Council of Constantinople in 381. Henceforth, Arianism ceased to be a power, except among its Teutonic converts. Now we return to the morrow of the Great Council. When the bishops returned home, they took up their controversies just where the summons to the council had interrupted them. The creed was signed and done with, and we hear no more of it. Yet both sides had learned caution at Nicaea. Marcellus disavowed Sabellianism, and Eusebius avoided Arianism, and even directly controverted some of its main positions. Before long, however, a party was formed against the council. Its leader was Eusebius of Nicomedia, who had returned from exile and recovered his influence at court. Round him gathered the bishops of the school of Lucian, and round these again all sorts of malcontents. The conservatives, in particular, gave extensive help. Charges of heresy against the Nicene chiefs were sometimes more than plausible. Marcellus was practically Sabellian, and Athanasius at least refused to disavow him. Some even of the darker charges may have had truth in them, or at least a semblance of truth. So in the next few years we have a series of depositions of Nicene leaders. By 335 the church was fairly cleared of all but the two chief of them, Marcellus of Anxira and Athanasius of Alexandria, since 328. Marcellus was already in middle life when he refuted the Arians at Nicaea, and in a diocese full of the strife and debate of endless Gaulish sects and superstitions, he had learned that the gospel is wider than Greek philosophy, and that simpler forms may better suit a rude flock. So his system is an appeal from Origen to St. John. He begins with the Logos, as impersonal, as at once the thinking principle which is in God, and the active creating principle which comes forth from God, and yet remains with God. Thus the Logos came forth from the Father for the work of creation, and in the fullness of time descended into human flesh, becoming the Son of God, in becoming the Son of Man. Only in virtue of this humiliating separation did the Logos acquire personality for a time, but when the work is done, the human flesh will be thrown aside, and the Logos will return to the Father, and be imminent and impersonal as before. Marcellus has got away from Arianism as far as he can, but he is involved in much the same difficulties. If, for example, the idea of an eternal son is polytheistic, nothing is gained by transferring the eternity to an impersonal Logos. And if the work of creation is unworthy of God, it matters little whether it is delegated to a created son or to a transitory Logos. Marcellus misses as completely as Arius the Christian conception of the Incarnation. Then they turned to a greater than Marcellus. Athanasius was a Greek by birth and education, Greek also in subtle thought and philosophic insight, in oratorical power and skilful statesmanship. Of Coptic influence he scarcely shows a sign. His style is very clear and simple, without a trace of Egyptian involution and obscurity. Athanasius was born about 297, so that he must have well remembered the last years of the Great Persecution, which lasted until 313. He may have been a lawyer for a short time, and seems to have known Latin, but his main training was Greek and scriptural. As a man of learning or a skilful party leader, Athanasius was not beyond the reach of rivals, but he was more than this. His whole spirit is lighted up with vivid faith in the reality and eternal meaning of the Incarnation. His small work, De Incarnatione, written before the rise of Arianism, ranks with the Epistle to Diognetus as the most brilliant pamphlet of early Christian times. Even there he rises far above the level of Arianism and Sabellianism. Throughout his long career we catch glimpses of a spiritual depth which few of his contemporaries could reach.
and athanasius was before all things a man whose life was consecrated to a simple purpose through five exiles and fifty years of controversy he stood in defence of the great council the care of many churches rested on him the pertinacity of many enemies wore out his life yet he is never soured but for a moment by the atrocious treachery of three fifty six at the first gleam of hope he is himself again full of brotherly consideration and respectful sympathy for old enemies returning to a better mind even gibbon is awed for once before the immortal name of athanasius marcellus had fairly exposed himself to a doctrinal attack but against athanasius the most convenient charge was that of episcopal tyranny in three thirty five the eastern bishops gathered to jerusalem to dedicate the splendid church which constantine had built on golgotha first however a synod was held at tyre to restore peace in egypt the eusebians had the upper hand and they used their power shamelessly scandal succeeded scandal till the iniquity culminated in the dispatch of an openly partisan commission including two young pannonian bishops Asatius and valence to get up evidence in egypt moderate men protested and athanasius took ship for constantinople the council condemned him by default and the condemnation was repeated at jerusalem where also proceedings were commenced against marcellus they also restored arius but his actual reception was prevented by his sudden death the evening before the day appointed meanwhile athanasius had appealed to constantine in person who summoned the bishops at once to constantinople they dropped the charges of sacrilege and tyranny and brought forward a new charge of political intrigue athanasius was allowed no reply but sent into exile at trier in gaul where he was honourably received by the younger constantine the emperor seems as usual to have been aiming at peace and unity athanasius was evidently a centre of disturbance and the asiatic bishops disliked him he was therefore best kept out of the way for the present constantine died twenty second may three hundred and thirty seven and his sons at once restored the exiles presently things settled down in three forty with the second son constantius master of the east and constans the youngest holding the three western prefectures so eusebian intrigues were soon resumed constantius was essentially a little man weak and vain easy-tempered and suspicious he had also a taste for church matters and without ever being a genuine arian he hated first the nicene council and then athanasius personally the intriguers could scarcely have desired a better tool they began by raising troubles at alexandria and deposing athanasius afresh late in three thirty eight for having allowed the civil power to restore him in lent three thirty nine athanasius was expelled and gregory of cappadocia installed by military violence in his place the ejected bishops athanasius marcellus and others fled to rome bishop julius at once took up the high tone of impartiality which became an arbiter of christendom he received the fugitives with a decent reserve and invited the easterns to the council they had asked him to hold after long delay it was plain that they did not mean to come so a council of fifty bishops met at rome in the autumn of three forty by which athanasius and marcellus were acquitted as julius reported to the easterns the charges against athanasius were inconsistent with each other and contradicted by evidence from egypt and the proceedings at tyre were a travesty of justice it was unreasonable to insist on its condemnation of athanasius as final even the great council of nicaea had decided and not without the will of god that the acts of one council might be revised by another and in any case nicaea was better than tyre as for marcellus he had denied the charge of heresy and presented a sound confession of his faith our own apostles creed very nearly and the roman legates at nicaea had borne honourable witness to the part he had taken in the council if they had complaints against athanasius they should not have neglected the old custom of writing first to rome that a legitimate decision might issue from the apostolic see the eusebians replied in the summer of three forty one when some ninety bishops met to consecrate the golden church of constantine at antioch hence it is called the council of the dedication 
like the Nicene, it seems to have been in the main conservative, but the active minority was Arianizing, not Athanasian, and it was not quite so successful. The bishops began, as at Nicaea, by rejecting an Arian creed. They next approved a creed of a conservative sort, said to be the work of Lucian of Antioch, the teacher of Arius. The decisive clause, however, was rather Nicene than conservative. It declared the Son morally unchangeable, the unvarying image of the deity and essence of the Father. The phrase declares that there is no change of essence in passing from the Father to the Son, and is therefore equivalent to homoousion. Athanasius might have accepted it at Nicaea, but he could not now, and the conservators did not mean homoousion, only the illogical homoousion of like essence. So they were satisfied with the Lucianic creed, but the Arianizers endeavoured to upset it with a third creed, and the council seems to have broken up uncertainly, though without revoking the Lucianic creed. A few months later, another council met at Antioch, and adopted a fourth creed, more to the mind of the Arianizer. In substance, it was less opposed to Arianism than the Lucianic. Its form is a close copy of the Nicene. In fact, it is the Nicene down to the anathemas, but the Nicene with every sharp edge taken off. So well did it suit the Arianizers that they reissued it with ever-growing anathemas three times in the next ten years. Western suspicion became a certainty, now that the intriguers were openly tampering with the Nicene faith. Constance demanded a general council, and Constantius was too busy with the Persian War to refuse him. So it met at Sardica, the modern Sophia, in the summer of 343. The Westerns were some ninety-six in number, with Hosius of Cardova for their father. The Easterns, under Stephen of Antioch, were about seventy-six. They demanded that the condemnation of Athanasius and Marcellus should be taken as final, and retired across the Balkans to Philippolis, when the Westerns insisted on reopening the case. So there were two contending councils. At Sardica the accused were acquitted, while the Easterns confirmed their condemnation, denounced Julius and Hosius, and reissued the fourth creed of Antioch with some new anathemas. The quarrel was worse than ever. But next year came a reaction. When the western envoy Euphrates of Cologne reached Antioch, a harlot was let loose upon him, and the plot was traced up to Bishop Stephen. The scandal was too great. Stephen was deposed, and the fourth creed of Antioch reissued, but this time with long conciliatory explanations for the westerns. The way was clearing for a cessation of hostilities. Constance pressed the decrees of Sardica, Osatius, and Valens recanted the charges against Athanasius, and at last Constantius consented to his return. His entry into Alexandria, 31st October 346, was the crowning triumph of his life. The next few years were an interval of suspense, for nothing was decided. Conservative suspicion was not dispelled, and the return of Athanasius was a personal humiliation for Constantius. But the mere cessation of hostilities was not without influence. The conservators were fundamentally agreed with the Nicenes on the reality of the Lord's divinity, and minor jealousies abated when they were less busily encouraged. The Eusebian phase of conservatism, which dreaded Sabellianism and distrusted the Nicenes, was giving place to the semi-Arian, which was coming to see that Arianism was the more pressing danger, and slowly moving towards an alliance with the Nicenes. We see also the rise of a more defiant Arianism, less patient of conservative supremacy, and less pliant to imperial dictation. The Anomoian leaders emphasized the most offensive aspects of Arianism, declaring that the Son is unlike the Father, and boldly maintaining that there is no mystery at all in God. Their school was presumptuous and shallow, quarrelsome and heathenizing, yet not without a directness and firm conviction which compares well with the wavering and insincerity of the conservative chiefs. Meanwhile, new troubles were gathering in the West. Constance was deposed, January 350, by Magnentius. After a couple of minor claimants were disposed of, the struggle lay between Magnentius and Constantius. The decisive battle was fought, 28th September 351, near Mercer in Pannonia, 
but the destruction of Magnentius was not completed until 353. Constantius remained the master of the world. The Eusebians now had their opportunity. Already in 351 to 352, the head reissued the fourth creed of Antioch from Sirmium, with its two anathemas grown into twenty-seven. But as soon as Constantius was master of Gaul, he determined to force on the Westerns an indirect condemnation of the Nicene faith in the person of Athanasius. A direct approval of Arianism was out of the question, for Western conservatism was firmly set against it by the Nicene and Sardican councils. The bishops were nearly all resolute against it. Liberius of Rome followed in the steps of Julius, Hosius of Cordova was still the patriarch of Christendom, and the bishops of Trier, Toulouse, and Milan proved their faith in exile. So doctrine was kept in the background. Constantius came forward personally before a council at Arles, October 353, as the accuser of Athanasius, while all the time he was giving him solemn and repeated promises of protection. The bishops were not unwilling to take the emperor's word, if the court party would clear itself of Arianism, and at last they gave way, the Roman legate with the rest. Only Paulinus of Trier had to be exiled. For the next two years, Constantius was busy with the barbarians, so that it was not till the autumn of 355 that he was able to call another council at Milan, where Julian was made Caesar for Gaul. It proved quite unmanageable, and only yielded at last to open violence. Three bishops were exiled, including Lucifer of Calaris in Sardinia. Lucifer's appearance is a landmark. The lawless despotism of Constantius had aroused an aggressive fanaticism. Lucifer had all the courage of Athanasius, but nothing of his wary self-respect and moderation. He scarcely condescends to reason, but revels in the pleasanter work of denouncing the fires of damnation against the disobedient emperor. A worthier champion was Hilary of Poitiers, the noblest representative of Western literature in the Nicene Age. Hilary was by birth a heathen, coming before us in 355 as an old convert and a bishop of some standing. In massive power of thought he was a match for Athanasius, but he was rather student and thinker than orator and statesman. He had not studied the Nicene Creed till lately, but when he found it true he could not refuse to defend it. He was not at the council, but was exiled to Asia a few months later, apparently on the charge of immorality which the Eusebians usually brought against obnoxious bishops. When Hosius of Cordova had been imprisoned, there remained but one power in the West which could not be summarily dealt with. The grandeur of Hosius was personal, but Liberius claimed the universal reverence due to the apostolic and imperial see of Rome. Such a bishop was a power of the first importance when Arianism was dividing the empire round the hostile camps of Gaul and Asia. Liberius was a staunch Nicene. When his legates yielded at Arles, he disavowed their action. The emperor's threats he disregarded, the emperor's gifts he cast out of the church. It was not long before the world was scandalized by the news that Constantius had arrested and exiled the bishop of Rome. Attempts had already been made to dislodge Athanasius from Alexandria, but he refused to obey anything but written orders from the emperor. As Constantius had given his solemn promise to protect him in 346, and three times written to repeat it since his brother's death, duty as well as policy forbade him to credit officials. The most pious emperor could not be supposed to mean treachery, but he must say so himself if he did. The message was plain enough when it came. A force of five thousand men surrounded the church of Theonus on a night of vigil, 8th February 356. The congregation was caught as in a net. Athanasius fainted in the tumult, yet when the soldiers reached the bishop's throne, its occupant had somehow been conveyed away. For six years Athanasius disappeared from the eyes of men, while Alexandria was given over to military outrage. The new bishop, George of Cappadocia, formerly a pork contractor, arrived in Lent 357, and soon provoked the fierce populace of Alexandria. He escaped with difficulty from one riot in 358, and was fairly driven from the city by another in October. Constantius had his revenge, but it shook the empire to its base. The flight of Athanasius revealed the power of religion to stir up a national rising, none the less real for not breaking out in open war. In the next century, the Council of the Church became the battlefield of nations, 
and the victory of Hellenic orthodoxy at Chalcedon implied sooner or later the separation of Monophysite Egypt and Nestorian Syria. Arianism seemed to have won its victory when the last Nicene champion was driven into the desert. But the West was only terrorized. Egypt was devoted to its patriarch. Nicenes were fairly strong in the East, and the conservatives who had won the battle would never accept Arianism. However, this was the time chosen for an open declaration of Arianism by a small council of Western bishops at Simeon, headed by Osatius and Valens. They emphasized the unity of God, condemned the words usia, homo usion, and homoi usion, lay stress on the inferiority of the sun, limit the incarnation to the assumption of a body, and more than half say that he is only a creature. This was clear Anomoian doctrine, and made a stir even in the West, where it was promptly condemned by the Gaulish bishops, now partly shielded from Constantius by the Caesarship of Julian. But the Samian Manifesto spread dismay through the ranks of the Eastern conservatives. They had not put down Sabellianism only in order to set up the Anomoeans, and the danger was brought home to them when Eudoxius of Antioch and Acacius of Caesarea convened a Syrian synod to approve the manifesto. The conservative counterblow was struck at Anskira in Lent 358. The synodical letter is long and clumsy, but we see in it conservatism changing from its Eusebian to a semi-Arian phase, from fear of Sabellianism to fear of Arianism. They won a complete victory at the court, and sent Eudoxius and the rest into exile. This, however, was too much. The exiles were soon recalled, and the strife began again more bitterly than ever. End of section 16